Open our Bibles to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And today we will be considering verse 171. Very short verse. David praying and through the psalm we read here in verse 171 let my lips utter praise and for our purposes this morning for thou dost teach me thy statutes. David recognizes that God has ways of teaching us. Last Lord's Day we considered David as a man of prayer and here we see him praying and specifically that he would be taught by God. David prayed for other things. He prayed for wisdom, guidance, protection, forgiveness. Those are things that we should pray about. Not just once in a while, but regularly. Those are crucial matters. Wisdom, we need that constantly throughout our life. Guidance and making decisions that impact our life, our family, others, our church. For protection, and Michael and I were vividly reminded of that uh, this morning on the way to church having witnessed a very, very, very severe wreck. And Michael and I do meet at my house early before we come to church. And I would say without fail, one of the things that we do pray for regularly as we meet together is Lord protect us on the freeway as we travel to church. Pray for that. For protection. Uh, we've mentioned another issue and that's forgiveness. We uh, need daily forgiveness. That's part of the way we are instructed in the Lord's Prayer. In our text we see that David was a man who worshipped. He worshipped God that is the true and living God. Now, a major part of our personal worship and our corporate worship is that of praise. Praising God. And each worship service, that focus should be on praising the true and living God, praising Christ who is the head of the church. And every part of our worship service should be geared and directed to that issue. I think of the hymn we sing, or the doxology really, that we have sung ahead of our meal when we were having two services. Praise God. And that is repeated and repeated and repeated in the doxology, which is a hymn of praise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise above you, heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now our text shows us 
clearly, David was motivated to offer praise to God. But it was praise to God for a specific issue or matter. It was praise to God for a spiritual blessing. Notice, I have used two words very carefully. Spiritual, spiritual blessing. There are physical blessings. Thanking God regularly for health and strength, mental health, physical health. Physical blessing. There are material blessings. Having our daily needs provided. But there are spiritual blessings. Blessings that are spiritual in nature. The spiritual blessing that we see here is <clears throat> being taught of God. And we call that divine illumination. Are you familiar with that term? Divine illumination. We could list other spiritual blessings, joy, peace, divine wisdom, uh, concerning the joy of the Lord, Nehemiah, for the joy of the Lord is your strength, and there's peace with God, Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. There's another spiritual blessing, divine wisdom, but our text zeroes in on, and so will we, the spiritual blessing of divine illumination. What is it? How would you define it? What does it mean to you? Divine illumination has to do with the understanding the God who gives his holy and infallible word. It comes from God himself. We have an example of it. You remember the post-resurrection and the encounter that Christ had with the men on the road to Emmaus? They were come conversing about the death of Christ and explaining it as best they understood it. Look with me, if you will, at Luke 24. Luke 24, beginning with verse 25. And he said to them, the men, Oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Now look very carefully. And beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. There is a prime example of divine illumination. He was the teacher. They were learning things that Christ himself was teaching. For us, what does any of this mean?
Think with me. Knowledge can be considered in two categories. Acquired knowledge and special knowledge. Acquired knowledge and special knowledge. Acquired knowledge is acquired simply by human effort, by reading, by listening, by studying. And that kind of knowledge is useful, obviously. You learn to read, you learn your math by rote memory. You can you learn history, you can learn science, you can learn many, many subjects on a grade school, uh, junior high, high school level, college level, doctorate level. It's acquired by your reading and studying and hearing. We might call it head knowledge. Facts learned, but with little or no real effect upon one's life. You might ask a person, if you're witnessing to them or concerned about their spiritual needs, Do you believe that you are a sinner? Do you? And the reply might be something like this. Well, I guess so, nobody's perfect. You see, the knowledge that one is a sinner can be in the category of head knowledge, factual knowledge, but it makes absolutely no impact upon one's life. Let's take that into the matter of the death of Christ, the crucifixion. Christ was buried, crucified, buried, and rose again from the dead. And a person can read that, remember it, memorize it, know it, without it making any, any impact upon the life whatsoever. That's head knowledge. It's acquired knowledge. A person can memorize the Ten Commandments, but continue living a life in defiance of those commandments. Nicodemus had a lot of acquired knowledge. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. Turn with me to John chapter 3 because I want to point out to you a very important word. John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, look very carefully at the next two words. We know. Interesting. We know. Really? How do you know it? Head knowledge. What is it they knew? You have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. That's interesting knowledge. But it wasn't saving knowledge. 
It was knowledge enough to physically bring Nicodemus to Christ at night to talk with him. And that's good. But uh, he didn't know saving truth, the new birth. And the new birth is spiritual truth. And at some point, Nicodemus came to grips with it as spiritual truth because it shows up at the crucifixion and he's a defender of Christ. So that truth at some point became spiritual to him in nature and made an impact upon his life. The knowledge he had out of curiosity brought him to Christ. But our Lord, in dealing with him, began to make Nicodemus the object of divine revelation. It began to unfold as if the light was turned on. Now I see. I've had the occasion to witness to different ones in different situations, particularly uh, I've mentioned Arturo as we were alone in the migrant camp in the building and God had so ordained that it was an opportunity for me to uh, share truth with, with him, with Arturo, and his response as I was unfolding some truths, he kept saying to me, I never knew that. I never knew that. I never knew that. Something was taking place in his heart and life. Truth was becoming a reality. Truth that he had bred. He was being looked upon by the priest of the church where he lived to study to be a, a priest. But it wasn't saving knowledge until God made it so. Acquired knowledge actually can make one to be arrogant, boastful, proud, all of which hinders one coming to Christ and knowing him. Now, this special knowledge that we've been talking about doesn't have that effect. It doesn't make you proud and boastful of your knowledge. It, if it's understood properly, it won't have that effect. Because it is a special and sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit described for us as that wisdom which comes from above. It humbles man. In fact, the more he knows of God, the more he understands these truths the more his own opinion in estimation of himself is lessened. There is a process which takes place in this illumination. Number one, there is a removal of natural blindness. Those words were chosen carefully. A removal of natural blindness. We are born spiritually dead. We are born spiritually ignorant of God, ignorant of the way to heaven. Peter describes it like this called 
out of darkness into his marvelous light. In Acts we read to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Paul writing to the Ephesians says, you were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. The removal of this natural blindness and the entrance of light. It's a double, twofold knowledge that comes together. We see not only our misery, but we also see the remedy of a blessing. Um, turn with me to Second Corinthians four and verse six. Second Corinthians four and verse six. Paul writing says, God who commanded, read this very, very, very carefully, light, the light to shine out of darkness. You would think that it would say light to shine in darkness. No. What is that? Light shining out of darkness. <clears throat> he goes on to say, has shined in our hearts to give us the light of what? <clears throat> the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Not head knowledge, not factual knowledge. Spiritual knowledge. You see, light that shines out of darkness is divine illumination. <clears throat> I'm going to read a rather lengthy quote, fairly lengthy. <clears throat> Please bear with me. We talked before of sin as a thing, of course, and uh, were wont to marvel why men kept such a deal uh, and a do about sin. But now, the case is altered. God has opened his eyes, and therefore he complains of it as the greatest burden, and fain would get rid of it at any time. He begins to seek after Christ as his only remedy, and nothing will satisfy him but Christ. And all things are but dung and dross in comparison of the excellency of Christ. And that he may be found in him, he lamenteth his case and can trust himself nowhere but in Christ's hands. A natural man slippeth into a heedless credulity and neither doth look upon the gospel as a real truth or else is not affected with it so as to venture his salvation on that foundation. Don't know if you followed that closely, but it is a good description of what takes place in a man's mind and heart when divine elimination happens. Then what happens? Progression. Progression. As to the increase and in progress and to so those who are taught of God need to be taught of God again and again and again and to seek a further increase of spiritual wisdom or a further degree of the saving knowledge of divine mysteries. Is that what grips your heart when you read your Bible? Or hear the word preached? Or read a good book? 
of theology. The Apostle Paul prayed for the believers at Ephesus. And this is how he prayed, that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation that the eyes of their understanding might be open. That's divine illumination. Are we consciously aware of it? Does that happen to us? We, we are yet ignorant in many things. For we know but in part, not fully rooted in the knowledge of these things, which we know they need to be refreshed with new elimination from God, that our knowledge may be active and lively and stand out against new and daily temptations and that oblivion and forgetfulness which is a kind of ignorance and is apt ever and anon to creep upon us may be prevented and truths may be ready at hand for our use. Do we know anything about that? In our personal devotions? In our corporate worship? David prayed specifically for an increase of knowledge. Being a holy man and a prophet, he needed not the first elimination, but every degree of knowledge, and he acknowledges that, coupled with praise. Now, let me cover a few final brief points. What's the value of this for you and you and me? Keep this in mind. Of this divine illumination, God is the author. God is the author. And by his efficacious teaching, he cures the blindness of our minds and opens and inclines the heart towards spiritual and heavenly things. John says, they shall all be taught of God. Paul uses that same phrase in Thessalonians. Ye yourselves are taught of God. Taught of God. Do you grasp that concept? Taught by God or of God. God's teaching never fails to be effectual. Never. One of the men who used to be an elder at Trinity, now serving in another church, but he taught in the academy. And he would speak to the pastors at the pastor's conference. And one time he used an illustration of uh, how you feel when you're physically one-on-one -on -one or even with a group of people teaching or preaching difficult truths to comprehend. And he said on one occasion, it's like nailing jello to the wall. It just keeps slipping out away. It doesn't stay. 
And that's frustrating uh, to any teacher or preacher because they are truths that are spiritually understood. Uh, Sebastian, one of the men that we work with, talked to me this week, and he's planning to deal one-on-one -on -one with one of these uh, apostolic believers who is in the process of leaving the uh, apostolic church there within the prison. And he wanted to talk to Sebastian about the Trinity. So Sebastian said, do you have any suggestions? I said, well, first of all, I said, you need to try to ascertain whether this man is saved. Because if he's not saved, he's spiritually blind. And I said, you sit down to talk to him about the Trinity. It makes, he's not going to grasp it. He doesn't have the wherewithal to grasp it. It is a spiritual truth. He is not spiritual. He is spiritual dead. I said, you might as well sit down and try to tell a man who was born blind what color red is. That's what we're talking about. Because if the blind man can open his eyes and see the color red. You really don't have to tell him. He can see it. Now. Now. I see. Has anything like that happened to you recently? In your own personal time with God? In his word? Or reading a good theological word? Containing the truth. And all of a sudden, you say, man, I never saw that before. That's what we're talking about. Well, let me hasten on. The objects known, the highest priority and most important thing that matters in the whole world is those truths that will be owned of God in a saving manner. By that I mean, for the believer, we are in a state of progression in sanctification. We're either increasing or we're not. We're either growing or we're not. Let me just ask you a question. What could have higher priority than the spiritual welfare of your soul. I'm asking you. Well, let me mention a couple of things that will help to do, put into our minds the use. The use for which this knowledge serves us. And there are two. Number one, it enables us actually to experience communion with God. Now, in the present tense, by increased knowledge spiritually, spiritual knowledge, we come to enjoy Him personally. Our communion is with God. First John. Our communion is with God. Is your communion with God? Secondly, the use and benefit is to enjoy Him forever. This is life eternal. That they may know thee. Know there's different words for knowing. We only have one in English. How many do we have in Spanish? At least two. Saber y conocer. They both are translated no, but it's a different kind of knowledge. Do you know God? J.I. Packer's written a good book called Knowing God. 
Do you know him? Finally, what does Christ signify for us? He is God's, you know, prophet, priest, and king. And the word prophet, he's our prophet to teach us. To teach us. Priest to intercede for us. King to rule over us. And that's what the word Christ should mean to you. Well, this is one of our more briefer ones this morning, which is fine. We can have some time to visit with one another and uh, until the service begins. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we ask that you would cause these truths to become a reality in our life, in our soul, as we seek to pursue uh, holiness, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of you. May we more and more experience the divine illumination, the reality of your truth gripping our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.